Ah, it's one of us. <laughs> All right, excellent. All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm going to sit back for a minute or two and hope that a few more people join us. Uh, so far, the crowd is pretty light, but uh, we'll give them a few minutes, and people always tend to join at the last minute. Yeah, this day and age, you're sitting in one meeting and go, oh, oh, I'm late to the other it's one. It's time for the next one. Here, here yeah. they come. Here's someone else. All right, well, while people are jumping in, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to this community conversation hosted by the Autodesk community. My name is Chris and I will be your host for today. It's my pleasure to welcome the one and only Phil Eichmiller who will be taking all of your Fusion 360 questions today. Anything you want to ask, let's uh, let's have at it. I'm I'm Phil Eichmiller, and uh, I'm a QA engineer on Fusion 360. So I work mostly on the modeling side, but I also, uh, you know, take uh, a good uh, long look at the width and and scope of everything Fusion does. And uh, so that's why I'm I'm here to answer those questions. But uh, in my heart, I'm just a designer and a modeler and a drafter and all those wonderful things, along with being a QA engineer. Awesome. So before we get going, just a little bit about our series here for those joining for the first time. Community conversations are a great way to get you together with expert speakers from around the community on a wide variety of topics such as workflow demonstrations, tips and tricks, and like this session, a question and answer session. Today's session is an open forum where Phil will answer any questions you might have or discuss pretty much anything related to Fusion 360. This, this series is generally monthly around this time, so keep an eye on the Community Conversations calendar for when the next session gets added so you can reserve your spot. And I'm gonna post that link to the calendar in the chat right now. I suggest bookmarking it so you don't miss out when new sessions are being added. So there is the link for you. Uh, we do always put up our safe harbor statement at the beginning of these, which is just a, a very quick explanation. It's just a way of saying that whatever gets discussed in this session, if it's a future looking statement, it is not a guarantee of any kind. And if you're making purchasing decisions about Autodesk software, look at them in the, the state that they are today only and not based on anything that might be said in this session. So before we jump in, we've got all of the lines muted, but we invite you to turn your cameras on if you're feeling comfortable doing so. If you have a question or comment for Phil, either use the raise hand from your Zoom menu or put your question into the chat. And we'll be keeping an eye on both of those throughout the session. We are recording this and the recording will be posted on the community conversation page as soon as it's available. And I'm gonna share that link to this session in the chat right now so that you can go back and follow up afterward. We invite you to continue the conversation on that page by adding comments. And of course, give us your, your likes and kudos on that page as well. So here is the link for today's session that you can go back and follow up on at any point in time. So with that, let's do some quick introductions. My name is Chris, as I said, I'm the community manager for product design and manufacturing. I'm a former customer and expert elite, as you can see by my hat, my area of expertise is in Inventor, so please don't be too hard on me. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Sean and Phil to do some quick introductions, and then Phil will take it from there. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, and I'll be back at the end of the session to wrap up with some more resources for you. So, Sean hey and Phil. I'm Sean Hurley. I'm an Autodesk Community Engagement Manager. Been with Autodesk a long time, and I'm multiple uh, catadextrous. So I've used Fusion, Inventor, AutoCAD, all, most all of our software. Um, I'm located in sunny and cold Bend, Oregon. Hi. Well, I, I accidentally already introduced myself because I missed my cue. <laughs> right. Sounded a bit like a cue. Um, so uh, as you heard, I'm a, I'm a QA working uh, on Fusion 360. It's uh, coming up on 10 years now. So, um, and I, I'm uh, enjoying life in sunny Portland, Oregon, uh, sunny and warm Portland, Oregon. So, if you can believe that. It's, I forgot uh, to mention, I'm in sunny believe and cold Michigan. <laughs> so uh, yeah, waiting for spring to start. Right now we're in uh, second winter is what I call it. So first winter is November, December, and January. And second winter is February, uh, March, and April. This is what we call fake spring. Yep. 
So uh, totally uh, happy to take any questions uh, right now about uh, any kind of uh, anything to do with fusion, um, you know, especially modeling related things, uh, drawing related stuff, um, renderings, I'm, I'm good with that stuff. We have a few, a few viewers here, uh, maybe, maybe they could unmute and ask what's on their mind or put it in the chat. Yep. Any, uh, anyone want to get the conversation started? That's always the hardest part is get that first <laughs> one breaking the ice. Yeah. Somebody's always, somebody's always got to think of a really good question to get the, the ball rolling. Stump Phil. Is, is there anything, uh, that you could, uh, share with us about the newest releases anything new that that people might not know about um well uh let's see let's see what i can uh i was oh i have a development build uh running right now so that's probably not going to be as helpful um let's go uh, last time we looked at the what's new, of course, we haven't had a major release since then. We were supposed to have a minor release this week, but we uh, have decided to hold off on that pending some some more testing uh, around we some did, the various... We did uh, a question in the chat here. Okay. How do you open comments from Fusion teams in Fusion? Ah, okay. I can demonstrate that. Awesome. Um, Thanks, yeah. Colin. Yeah, I'll put this over here and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. How's that look? Nice, bright fusion. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, I want to put the comments box up here because I like to have it up at the top. And um, what you'll see is that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it of course folds all the way open, but, and this is an unsaved design, so there's no comments here. But the comments in Fusion Teams and the comments in Fusion are one and the same. So um, let's uh, let's open up the Accurate Hamburger, and um, uh, let's see. Let's go to let's see Hamburger Explode. I know what's going to happen if I open up the world's most accurate hamburger. I'm hoping it doesn't happen here. Which is um, since this is a development build, you'll see a few bug alerts for. Uh, uh, some stuff that's it's a cu normal customer would never see this. This is all uh, in, inside the guts of Fusion stuff, and it's completely uh, harmless, but it probably doesn't look super slick. There we go. Oh, uh, let's see. Ah, okay. Um, I won't trust that anyway. Sounds like a good plan. All right, so no bug alerts. Um, this this hamburger only has lettuce on it, which is good because I'm I'm vegan personally. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go um, over here and uh, view the details on the web and see if I can get uh, get this to open up and we can do kind of little A B back and forth just to give it a just to give it a bit of exercise. Um, all right, so. Here's this, let me move Zoom over to this window and uh, um, let's see, add a seeing, comment. Is everyone seeing uh, the screen that Phil's sharing? I asked because Colin posted that he's not seeing anything. Uh, okay. Um, I can see it. I, I think it was it? just a, a matter there's, of syncing. There's a oh, hamburger well, in the middle, a, a yep. spinny wheel. Now I'm, I'm looking at Fusion Team right now. Are you seeing that? Yes, sir. Okay. The bug bash files. The bug yeah. Bash. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So yeah, this was uh this was a the start of a hamburger or the, what's left of it anyway. Um looks delish. Please make me one. LOL. Okay. So I'm gonna post up that comment and um, let's go back to fusion and see how long it takes for this comment to appear. And I'll hit refresh. And there's the comment. And I'll say, well, um, that's five bucks for you. And I'll post that. Five bucks without any cheese on it, at least. <laughs> yep. 
and uh, let's see what uh, let's see what happens here. Um, now I don't know about the refresh here, so let's see how long if I have to just load the web page or if it'll do it automatically. I don't know for sure. I want to go ahead and refresh. I bet you we'll we'll see some results. <laughs> Here we are, five bucks for you. Now, one thing I want you to notice here is that um, these comments are actually tagged with which version you're on. So um, you might, uh, you could end up, you know, making comments on V3 or V4, you know, V4 looks better, right? So as you're, as you're having this back and forth with whoever's on your team, um, you're always referring to exactly which design you're talking about, right? So if it's, you know, if you made changes between V2 and V3 and you're trying to get some confirmation that this is, looks like the hamburger you want, um, then um, you can have, uh, you know, you can have this conversation based on those, those versions. Um, also, Fusion, if you look over here in the data panel, Fusion gives you access to all the older versions. So you can even open up and comment on those if you want. So if I open up version two and comment on it, and I'm not, I won't put you through the pain of watching that stuff happen slowly. But um, if I commented on version two, then whoever the other user is that's looking at it, at, let's say in Fusion Teams, would see that I was commenting on version two, like saying, no, no, I like, I like this feature of version two better than what's in version three. And so you're always having that contextual conversation. So Sean says he wants vegan bacon on his. I think vegan. that's going to be it. That's an upcharge if you ask me. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and and unfortunately, <laughs> there isn't any good vegan uh, vegan bacon products out there. I, I've had a few of them, and they taste a little bit like bacon, but I don't think you can ever quite get there in that regard. So vegan bacon bits is your best bet because regular bacon bits are pretty much <laughs> the same thing. Uh, all right. Okay, I already learned something new about Fusion today. I didn't even know you could do that. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's a great way to communicate. You know, one of the, so I'll tell a story from uh, traveling to visit customers. And um, in uh, 2019, I was lucky enough to be invited to Japan to participate in the, um, the uh, uh, Fusion Academy uh, being held over there. Um, by the uh, Japanese sales team. They put together a big sort of a miniature Autodesk University for Fusion in Japan. And I went to speak at that and then I got some, some days to spend with customers. And sure enough, the very first customer I sat down with was the owner operator slash idea person and their designer. And the designer would be sitting in Kamakura doing their designs while the owner operator was riding around the subway in Tokyo looking at things on their phone and making comments. And so it was this exact workflow um, on a daily basis for a couple of people who um, were doing everything as dynamically as they could um, in, in real time. Uh, it, was, it was a really neat demonstration and they had lots of good feedback for me. So I'm just glad I visited them. So. Yeah, that's a great workflow actually. All right, who's got, who's, who's got one? Who's got another question for Phil? Anyone? Come on, get a hard one. There's gotta be, somebody has something they just wondered how or why or what to do. I, I bet you Michael has a question about rendering glass. Ooh. It's true, I do. <laughs> yep. Should we you, go for it live? Yeah, any chance let's, you let's can any chance you can show that model you showed me earlier. All right. <laughs> That's not why I came here today, Phil, but <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I, I want to see I want to see if I'm right. All right. Hold on a second. Here, let me let me stop sharing because we can throw you the stage, I believe. And so if we go back over here and look at my because I like cars, who doesn't? That's a brilliant model, by the way. Thank you. And so I have a Batmobile vibe to it. I've, I've wanted to get a 63 Riviera and cut the top off of it and, and paint a yellow five on the side. And just Absolutely. It so it's a good idea. If I move the browser out of the way a little bit. And what Phil is uh, referring to is I'm having a little trouble with my rendering today. 
And so if I go to the rendering workspace, if I look at the in canvas render, I start an in canvas render for those of you who are following along at home, you can render in canvas or on the cloud. You can see my uh, driver's side headlight is not showing up as it's uh, attempting to come over here. It, it, well, it is showing up. It's just, it looks like it's just absorbing all the light that comes towards it. It, it is, you're right. And so if I look at the other side, I, I am getting the, uh, the non-driver side. And you can see that it's starting to show a little bit that the translucency is working. Huh. And then I've got a couple of other faces dropping out. And so that's, a, you know, just from a, so I'll always jump in and ask Phil. So this is one of those hard ones that we get occasionally. So okay, can, can you zoom up a little bit so I can see, sort of kind of see both of the headlights at once. This and, the purest glass in the world? Yeah. Right? Invisiglass? Yeah, it may be. Well, it's got to be bulletproof for speed racer. So that's that's yeah. the first you difficulty. Put some dirt on the window and you'll see it. Can, yeah. can you open up appearance materials for me? And let's just take a look at what um, is going on with those materials. So which glass is used there? Uh, well, that's okay. good. Uh, you know, because it is you know, glass. That's, well, that's, that's going to be one of them right there. I mean, it's translucency in materials. It's not really intended to be see-through right it's you're not going to get like a, a glass or or a, a lit effect i mean you could you could try to make it um you know uh what i'm losing the words here the uh, emissive there we go you're looking at the emissive colors right now um so it, it really do you want it to shine in the dark or do you want it to just look like glass when you render it hey, you know i'm flexible like i was just looking at this model today going trying to get it to the you know most complete stage because you can see it kind of works in this preview the shaded mode but yep. it's not it's not super great in the rendering and that's where i was okay trouble. so i'm fine with yeah. if i needed to use a yellow or amber glass i can yeah it's it's a little surprising that one of them's black and one of them isn't i'm almost wondering if you might have like two bodies under uh one of them that's and i mean if like is there two bodies in one place and maybe one of them's taken um yeah let's see uh body no not that one that's, so if you seem... do a long hold on a left mouse button for anybody watching, you can kind of do a, a how do we call it a depth pick? Depth yeah, selection. it's it's select other is the formal word for it. There we, we call go. it uh, we call it the X ray vision. Um, so what are the, what does it say under parents right there? So face body, and then the that looks like the whole assembly. So it's weird. It's almost like, is it, I guess it's body 132. If you click that, does that select it? It doesn't, doesn't look real selected right now. It doesn't maybe in the design workspace. It would yeah. Is, is that just a face and not a body on its own then? That's a good question. I don't remember. Let's select it and type the letter V. See what happens. Uh, maybe without the marking menu. Um, okay, now click in space there. So there seems like there's something else there, but yeah, half of it went away. So it is just a surface body. Okay, well this is this is where I might be a little out of school. I think if it's a surface body, it's it's going to be it's going to behave a little differently than solid bodies when you're rendering. That's for sure. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, my my first inclination because I I always deal in solids. Um, <laughs> would be to thicken it towards the inside and give it a glass, t uh, some sort of glass okay. appearance, and and then uh, try again. The the thing I wanted to show you, if if you just go to appearances and and we can cut to the chase real quick here for anyone watching. Um, if you go to appearances and just right click on any of the glasses that are in there, right? So the plain glass, yep, that one there. I'll right click and edit that. Um, there's a value right there, the absorption distance. And so what that means is, is it, at what distance is all of the light absorbed by this material? So um, imagine the, the window glass that's uh, on the window next to you or on any building, right? Um, especially tinted glass that you might find on a, uh, uh, like a high rise or something. If that glass was one meter thick, would any light go through it? No, because you know it looks clear when it's an eighth of an inch thick or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, 
but once it's several feet thick, how much lights are actually getting through that? And while that might not be the best approximation for um, real world, you know, like, I mean, obviously nobody has one meter thick glass anywhere, right? But if you're rendering things with glass and you're finding the glass is just turning out dark, um, it's probably because it's it might be thicker than uh, than a normal piece of glass. And so that absorption distance is kicking in and absorbing all the light. Um, yeah, you, you have to, yeah, yeah. And you, if you, there you go, you got it. Um, so that that might be what's happening. Um, and if you ever see that with, with glass stuff, so. There you go. Now, unfortunately, you can see the inside, but maybe in the render, it it'll sort of, you know, it'll the the glare, the the fog of um, reflections and things might just make it look like glass. Yeah. So it know. always takes a little bit of uh, trial and error playing around with it when these things happen. So it's yeah. a, you got a pretty heavy reflection on it coming in. This yeah, is a nice way to get your rendering underway with the in canvas rendering versus doing a full rendering and then coming back 10 or 20 minutes later and not being yeah. happy yeah i always i always say this is like the preview and if if you dig it you can let it go all the way and send it to somebody real quick and if you just want to get the thing lined up right and the shadows right this is the way to do it and then then fire off a, a an enormous you know cloud render for a couple bucks um for whatever your commercial purposes are yeah that's what that's when it becomes worth it um well, um, I don't know if we're going to solve the the world's problems with this model right this second, Michael. Um, well, thanks I, for I have a feeling, looking at it, though. Yeah, yeah. If if you still run into this stuff and have more questions, maybe just share it with me later. And if I got time, I'll definitely take a look at it. It's a, sure. it's a cool looking model. Big fan. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it's one of the. <laughs> you you want to go into the wayback machine? Why am I a mechanical engineer designer? uh you know a machine freak and it's because i watched this show as a child where this car would zoom down the road and somebody would hit a button and little skids would pop out little mechanical things would pop out and make the car fly through the air um it's just uh uh <laughs> what are you showing us you're showing us internal stuff here i think michael you might want to stop yeah sharing. we're gonna edit that um, I was just going to show you the real model of the car when, when it got built. And so someone's got a real one, huh? Yeah. Sorry. It's, uh, we're just going through memory lane here a little bit. Uh, yeah. Well, so we are broadcasting the, to the universe too. Yes, so. we are. And so there's the real model. Wow. Someone's made one. Yeah, we did. Cool. So you have to grow a mustache then if, and wear a, wear a cap like a, you know, like, Pops. like you said on the show, when Pops Racer hid the the blueprint in the windshield of the Mach Five, that was uh, that was my <laughs> moment. Where it was like I need to work here at Autodesk. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. That's uh, I don't remember that one. I just remember the, you know, like when the other racing team would stack up the cars. I'm like, that looks impossible, and it just uh, really inspired me to think that anything was possible. Um, flying cars, jumping cars, little buzz saws in front of it to cut down the trees so they could drive through the forest. You know, totally true. Uh, yeah, wouldn't be surprised if they've done that car as a soapbox racer uh, in Portland in the summer. <laughs> you could. I've okay. seen R2D2. I've seen all kinds of ones. I bet you that they've done one like that. It yeah. seems like a natural. What, what would it take to get a, a Miata with a new body on it? You know? <laughs> well, you got that, you got the weight, you know, you're not allowed to have over. So, yeah. No, no, I mean, not, not for the soapbox area. I'm just, I'm oh. just spiraling out into like all the possibilities. Like, if you're going to do that, then heck, Still you know, it's the like, real thing. Can you just, yeah, can you just rip the, or, you know, just, take like a body kit and just stick it onto a, a Miata, you know, with, with heavy double stick tape. And all of a sudden it's a seamless, perfect white uh, Mach 5. Or, or one of the, you know, Tesla uses their rolling chassis for everything. So yep. just drop it on a Tesla chassis. Totally makes sense. All right. Well, um, I don't know if there's anything else uh, we want to, we want to demonstrate here. Um, I could uh, I could show uh, a little bit of some workflow or something like that. I mean, I I was teaching uh, in my class this week at Portland Community College. I was teaching a bit about the plastic design tools. Um, so we're we had a we had a neon sign project, and uh, 
uh, at the start of the term, which is a couple of weeks ago, to teach uh, it's advanced fusion. So I'm teaching the first thing I teach them is, well, you're going to learn how to 3D sketch today by making a neon sign. Um, and then uh, and then a couple of weeks later, we, we take that and we make a plastic part base for the neon sign to sit in like those cheesy touristy kind of neons that'll sit out on your desktop. Um, so if that sounds interesting, you know, I could, uh, you know, I'm sitting here talking about it. I should probably just go ahead and fire I think up production. Cool. Um, yeah. you know, and if anybody pops in with a question, we can do that. And if not, we can wrap it up and hopefully everybody tells everybody about the, the you know, having the resource of, uh, of Phil and there's going to be a big promotion around it. So get your I'm get, questions I'm in getting now a promotion. next time you might not be able to. Oh, you mean promoting the event? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, we're, we're promoting you. That's right. <laughs> we're yeah, selling yeah. it. I'm chief know-it-all. I'm the chief know-it-all <laughs> officer. Um, all right, so I'm firing up the production version of Fusion so I can just show you the, the schoolwork because it's it's much better to put it all in a context. You know, it's such a visual mm -hmm. thing. You kind of have to see it. So it um, takes Fusion precisely one minute to start up um, unless I have to log in, which might take a few more seconds. I hope it's as eclectic as the models have been so far. Hamburger, Speed Racer. Hopefully, this is a flamingo neon. <laughs> uh, I no, it's to you guys. I did not recognize that car as Speed Racer. That's how long it's been since I've seen that show. <laughs> oh. well, it's it's, Sorry. it's I know. seared I know. into my mind. <laughs> um. And I'm serious about a 63 Riviera. Look at the front end of a 63 Riviera and tell me that that is not a, uh, somehow related to the Mach 5. It could have been the inspiration. Yeah. I mean, the rest of the cars is just a big boat. There's no way you could ever do all the same stuff with it. But um, shapes are shapes. And the language of shapes is an amazing language. And it's something that gets handed down with our eyeballs and our brains and, and our hands and not necessarily anything we ever talk about. So, all right. Fusion is starting up. Come on, Fusion. Let's go. Uh, maybe it'd help if I clobbered my VPN for a second. Let's uh, let's suspend that. There's no sense in pretending I'm from San Rafael or wherever right this minute. Might make things go faster here. Do do do. All right, here we go. And this over here and go ahead and share screen. All right, so here is, uh, this is my official uh, teaching license. Um, so this is me as a customer and I'm gonna go down to uh, my own single user storage, soon to be going away um, with any luck. I don't know if that's official yet, but soon meaning sometime in the next several years, um, but certainly not in the plans to expand. So here is, um, here's the first project we do. So it's a neon sign. I have a yellow sketch um, that's unavoidable in this case because I, I did so much to it that um, I somehow made it unhappy and I can't figure out how to make it happy again. Um, but taking a, a, an approach to design a neon sign, you know, it necessitates um, learning how to make 3D sketch paths. So um, that's that's where that comes from. Um, now, it's really helpful if you're going to do things like this and use 3D sketching um, to, to come up with some parameters to help you. In this case, um, I'm using tube diameter. But um, by the time the students got this, we also had um, something, I don't know, there's no technical term for it, but it's the, the depth from the front of the sign to the back of the sign where you do the, the behind the scenes spaghetti that gets painted black. Um, so, you know, I'll just call that uh, drop back depth, right? And so if you know your neon sign is gonna be, let's say an inch deep for all of that stuff to happen. So you don't want it to be super thick because you're putting this maybe in the window of a, of a restaurant or a bar or something. Um, you might only have this be like 1.5 inches or so. Um, so a tube diameter that's, you know, you can change if you buy a uh, different glass, right? You're going to want to be able to, to change your entire neon sign and say, oh, we're making this in 3 8 inch glass or half inch glass. 
I don't know the neon world well enough to know what sort of standards they use, but I got to imagine that different tube sizes is part of that standard. So having a, a using and uh, building the sweep um, from uh, from these name parameters really lets you make some global changes almost immediately. And of course, uh, some people might have noticed that my sketch is not constrained. This is one of those projects where I don't um, enforce any sort of sketch constraints because um, it's that's just going to get in your way of learning how to 3D sketch. Here is the tube itself. Um, so the air is in the middle and the glass is over here and uh, it's being driven by the tube diameter dimension. So if you change that parameter, um, this would change, all of this would change. And of course the whole thing automatically updates and you have either a slightly bigger or littler neon sign at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> now, a uh, funny little bug here. Um, if you ever do face overrides um, on your models and you notice that they go away, um, I'm gonna just go ahead and demonstrate this because I'd rather if anybody sees this, I want them to know what to do here. Um, I'm gonna compute all which is on the modify menu um, and it gets back these faces so i i still haven't heard from the development team why this happens but any amount of rolling the timeline and then rolling it again um, or editing something earlier in time like i was just editing the sketch way back which necessitated a timeline roll um, that makes the face overrides go away and um, compute all makes the face overrides come back so hopefully this is something they can address at some point um, with, so there's, you know, people aren't just repeatedly applying face overrides to their models. Anyway, so that's the neon sign itself. Um, so, and I chose, I chose this subject matter because it says rugs, like who doesn't like rugs? And I wanted it to be easy. So a lot of the students picked easy things like open or, you know, eat at Joe's or something like that. Um, so just simple lettering is all that's required for this project. Now in the, um, oops, not the egg carton. No, no, a couple weeks later, this is what we just did this week. Um, we have this uh, sort of create the rest of the neon sign thing. So I made a nice fusion logo um, a while back. This is actually not a brand new model. And uh, if we type um, V for visibility, um, you could turn off that body. And you can see I have a, a switch built into it. And I have some plastic features like uh, this interior is all, uh, uh, shelled um, to the point where there's you know a little bit of a radius here and there there's draft everywhere there's a web feature to add some strength um, because you know these neon tubes can get pretty heavy um, just kidding of course um, so this was the this was sort of closing the loop on that project You're like well if I created something like that what do we do with it um, so that's my example file um, here's rugs um, it's been inserted as as a uh, external reference um, i've started work on the base here so i've got the little legs that hold it up and and hold the glass and on the inside um, we don't really have very much going on and uh, you might notice too that it's uh, everything's made out of steel right now um, unfortunately um, which is odd i wonder why the inserted reference would show up as steel when it's clearly not um, because when you turn on uh, physical materials, it, what it should do is show you what the physical materials are for everything. And I'm pretty darn sure um, this is not steel. Oh, I'm a bad boy. That's so weird. I thought I used glass and argon right off of the physical materials list. Okay, well, that's my, that's my bad. Something to go fix. Um, but let's let's look at the plastics workflow. So if I go over to plastics, um, now what you're going to find here is that I have all of my plastic. Uh, this is the uh, what's called the product design extension. I have all of my tools turned on. Um, this is a paid for extension. So um, by default, commercial customers would have a little symbol that looks like a plug that sits right here that says, um, "Hey, you need to uh, you need to purchase this or turn it on for a trial. You can turn it on for a." a uh, I believe it's a seven day trial and give it a try. Um, but here's the cool part. Um, the plastics design infusion works the way sheet metal does. Sheet metal has always been a, a, a design and fabrication process that's heavily dependent on the material, right? So you're gonna get vast differences between a 20 gauge sheet of steel or an eighth inch steel plate. And you can bend both of them and cut both of them in the same machinery and you wouldn't use the eighth inch plate in place of the, the 20 gauge steel, right? So you can't imagine a computer case, you know, made for 
you know, made out of something like that. It doesn't make sense. So it's all rules based, right? And that's the beauty of sheet metal is you can quickly change your whole design by saying, oh, you know, we tried 16 gauge and we really need to go to 18 gauge and make it lighter. And then you can just make that change and everything globally updates because you picked a new material. Well, they took that same approach with the plastic design tools. It's like, why should you get all the way to the end of a plastic design and send it to somebody to fabricate it only to find out that um, you didn't follow the rules required for that sort of plastic part or that material. You have things that are too thick or too thin or little knife edges. Um, your draft angles aren't really doing the right thing. And if you've gotten all the way to the end of a fully uh, featured model and you get that kind of information, you literally go back to the very beginning of the process and have to redo the entire model and hope you get it right. Um, so we're closing that loop early for everybody who does anything with plastic by uh, having plastic rules. And so um, you see they have a assigned plastic rules and there's this library it comes with and you can make any of these whatever you want. Um, but these are standard. Um, the one that says test next to it is one I added, but there's um, the, the default ones. I'm going to get off of that or it's going to keep doing the tooltips. Um, ABS, nylon, and so forth, and various thicknesses, millimeters and inch, uh, for instance. Um, and, um, you know, this is, this is assigning the plastic rule. So right now I would pick a component and pick a rule and that would assign that rule to the component. And then now Fusion is gonna help me with things like what is my fillet radius? What is my thickness and so forth? And I'll show you what that looks like. So if I've assigned a rule and I haven't yet, actually, I'm gonna show you another workflow in just a second. Um, uh, opening up the library, where did it go? Did it show up over here? It did, showed up on my other monitor. All right, so managing plastic rules. Now this is where the magic happens, right? So let's say um, let's say we, we want uh, an ABS inch-based rule, or let's go to millimeters, because that's more common, I think, for this kind of stuff. So ABS 1.5 millimeters, but we do everything in ABS at two millimeters. We just have, right? That's our, I'm just being, putting on the customer hat here. So I want to create a new plastic rule and I'm gonna just change this to two millimeters and go over here and change the nominal thickness to two millimeters. And uh, the thickness range might be more like 1.75 millimeters to maybe 3.75 millimeters now that I've gone up a little bit in thickness. I'm gonna keep the same draft angle, uh, minimum draft angles, uh, knife edge threshold and so forth. Um, all of that I'm just going to keep. Um, the nominal radius is half the thickness. Um, I think that's fine for now, unless I unless I want to somehow be really specific that every radius has to be a certain uh, radius, which doesn't make sense at this point. I'll click save and um, also um, uh, let's see. Oh, I don't need to do anything here. So now, um, if I was to go to apply this plastic rules, um, I have this two millimeter ABS I can use. Now I wanted to show you something kind of cool. Um, this fusion will will keep you from uh, getting too far here. And so I'm gonna just start the web tool and go ahead and uh, work in like we're uh, like we're putting some webs in the in the, the lid of this thing to give it some more strength. And uh, that starts with a sketch. So I'll start a sketch and uh, let's uh, let's put, I don't know, I, I always I like circular web for some reason. It just seems cool. Um, and I'll put these lines in here. So um, an, a, a thoroughly unconstrained sketch, that's okay. That's not the point of this demonstration. Um, but now the second I try to use something that requires a plastic rule, um, Fusion is gonna interrupt me and tell me that uh, I need to do something here. So right now the web command is exists. This is a legacy tool for Fusion or at least prior to plastics. So I haven't, touched any of the plastics design code. So right now, this is also available over on solid. You don't have to pay for some of these plastic tools like web, but it's here because it's part of the plastic tools. But watch this. If I decide to turn on the radius value, um, and where the heck is that? Ah, fillet radius, here we are. So um, now if I decide to turn on the fillet radius value, um, well, it should be trying to tell me that I need to do something here. Let's see. It did not do that. I'm um, not sure why. Um, let's uh, let's.
back up. <laughs> and uh, let's see about adding a boss. I'm trying to get it to fusion to force me. Here we are. This is what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to get it to force me to assign a plastic rule. It's the whole point of this demonstration here. Um, so you won't get too far. If you're using this and you uh, are using the plastic tools, you're going to have to pick a plastic rule. That's a great sort of catch-all to keep you from uh, getting too far without actually following the rules that you've set forth. So I'm going to pick ABS two millimeters, and then I can set about you know adding uh, something. I'll just put a boss in here right now um, and set this to be a, a number six fastener. And... Uh, I want to flip the direction of the boss. There we are. And you'll notice when you get to the screw head side of the boss, um, what you'll get is that fastener. So the last time we met, um, I was unaware that this was already part of Fusion. I thought it was something that was uh, coming. So I alluded to it as something that's new. But check out what's going on here. Um, you pick. Uh, you picked your fastener, right? So rather than design your boss and then put a fastener in it that fits that, you pick your fastener and Fusion builds you the boss that fits that. Um, so you don't have to do a whole lot of extra modeling to get stuff like this done. Now, we don't have a cover on this thing to show what the other half of the boss looks like. Um, but I think this is sufficient to show you some of this awesome magic that's going on here. And uh, it's all, of course, you notice how many settings were involved there. And so now I've got a fastener. Um, I, it's inserted as uh, a uh, uh, ex external reference. Um, it lives um, down in this hole where it's supposed to, although this is you know, not as realistic as it could be. And uh, where did that show up? Um, well, I have a fasteners folder now. Um, and this is basically a, a configured fastener built off of this. So you, you, you won't even wind up with, uh, you know, like an individual, like if I have an eighth inch or quarter inch or three, three sixteenths inch screws, you're not going to wind up with a whole bunch of those. It's always just going to refer to this and apply the length that's specified by this command, the boss command to this um, in this design. So it's something completely new, a brand new kind of workflow for Fusion, um, designing around um, the things that, that matter most and put the shapes in that fit those things, right? One of the reasons this matters the most to me, for instance, is in a lean manufacturing set, uh, situation, you probably want to use as few fasteners as possible. In terms of fastener types, you might have your favorite fastener types and so forth. So being fastener centric in the way you uh, assemble things, going right back to sheet metal, that's where I learned that because all the sheet metal parts I used all had a very specific set of fasteners and uh, I didn't, uh, I, you know, I, I wish I could have put those in and then had all the sheet metal just mold around the screws I wanted to use rather than doing it the other way around. But those were those were the dark ages of CAD and 3D uh, in the world when I was doing that stuff. So there's your there's your demo of some plastic tools. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in here. Um, there's this cool geometric pattern. There's snap fits. Um, again, there's web and rib have been around forever and they're just included in this. And uh, I hope at some point, maybe they'll add some more, some more features and commands to this, but really cool way to make designs without, without getting too far in the process, uh, making uh, errors. One last demo, design advice. I'll click on this thing, um, pick the pull direction, which is gonna be up and analyze. Look, it's analyzing thickness, undercuts, draft and knife edges. And uh, let's see what it says, view results. Uh-oh, there's a large thickness right here. So it looks like my bosses um, maybe um, are violating the rules a little bit, or I should inspect that. Let's see, um, where's the other recommendations? I think these are probably all of the recommendations um, that were just shown. So go back to the main list, there we are. Uh, oh, undercuts, uh-oh. Apparently there's some undercuts. Maybe it's because there's zero draft in this. Did I, this, no, there's draft there. All right, well, I have to find out why there's undercuts. And uh, insufficient draft. There we are. Those are not drafted at all. I know that. So it's definitely giving me plenty of advice of things to go look at. And this puts this power in the hands of the designer um, and, lets the designer provide a lot of value to the rest of the process down the road. Cool. 
and that's it. Awesome. Well, you've always been a rule breaker, Phil. Yeah. Well, and plastics is forgiving, right? I mean, just because those things violate the rules doesn't mean it's not going to work. There's, you know, the, the ultimate test would be to go into simulation and, uh, you know, here's, a, here's, there's injection molding simulation, right? So the idea is to, to get to this stage with something that's probably going to pass the simulation, you know, and then if it passes both the design check and the simulation, when you go to blow $70,000 on tooling, um, you'll probably won't have as much back and forth communication about that great big transaction with your tooling provider. They'll, they'll do the same sort of testing and figure out that you don't need that much advice this time around. And then they, their engineering fees, you know, that they normally charge you go right out the window and they start wondering if you're the best customer. But, you know, that's, that's the business practices of other people. And I'm in the software business, so I can't speculate about that. Awesome. Good job. Yep. All right. Well, let's, let's wrap her up. We're almost at time. And, um, yeah, good stuff covered in there, Phil. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, happy to, to share any wisdom and insights I have. So um, spread the word, um, show Good up people. live, ask me questions live, and uh, we'll see you next month. Yeah, for, for those watching the video recording, definitely go out there to the event gu guide. And there's a bunch of uh, design and, and uh, manufacturing sessions, including Phil and other uh, Fusion 360, right down to machining and electronics and all that good stuff. Electronics is coming up really quick. So that's another good one to sign up for. Yep. Check out all these great community resources as well while you're watching the video. See what uh, see what interests you. We want to hear from you. We want to see your face in the in the community. We want to talk to you as much as possible. And uh, that's it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thanks a bunch. Thank you, Phil, Thanks, and everybody that joined us and. Good to see you, Jeff. Virtually, at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like likewise. <laughs> I'm always happy to to um, fusion chats like this. Excellent. Yeah. Well, there's gonna there's gonna be a bunch more, and there's a big promotion coming on them, as I understand it. So. All so, right. So we're on the ground like floor. Fun. <laughs> <laughs>